Okay, so it is 9.30 and I've got a lot of participants, 22, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you can hear my voice a little bit, it's a, a little bit congested, but I'm feeling absolutely fine. It feels like it was just a cold. So, but like I said in lecture <laughs> last week, the COVID thing is not done. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share my screen and gonna start at the PowerPoint where we would have left off. Let's see here. Okay, so get to my PowerPoint. Okay, so can you see this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, do you see the little dialogue box for the Zoom at the bottom like I see it? I don't know what it looks the like. Chat. Yeah, okay, so that's a little annoying, so I'll see if I can minimize it. Oh, that's good. Okay, so I'm gonna go back up here. Um, what was covered on the pre-recorded Zoom lecture that I emailed a link to about, that was recorded, I think it might've been last fall, I can't recall. So it's the same material. Um, there might've been a slide that's different, but everything is the exact same. Um, and I really do want you guys to email me with any questions that you have. And I have had a few students email me and then that makes me feel good because it means you looked at the material, you listened to the YouTube video. Um, so you had questions. So everything in yellow is what was covered in that YouTube lecture, not the most ideal thing, just like today. Um, but those are the things you wanna go over and make sure that you're clear on and um, I guess I'm just gonna assume that we're good with that material unless I get questions from you. So what we're doing today is we're moving on to gluconeogenesis and, and don't be surprised if um, some cats end up showing up on this video because I've tried to lock them in the bedroom, but sounds like one broke through. So, okay, so I'm going to try my pen out here. That's working. Yes, it is. Awesome. So we had covered this before in the YouTube lecture. Glucose goes through glycolysis and makes pyruvate. And then in the YouTube video, you learned that if there was no oxygen, there would be anaerobic respiration. All right. And then if there was oxygen, well, there was oxygen. It would go through pyruvate conversion, Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain. So that's what that YouTube video covered. So a lot of G words, this is where you're going to want to use your uh, cards if you make them, uh, Quizlets, because there's a whole bunch of G words. There's glucose, glycogen, glycolysis, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis. It's, a, it's a very confusing. So do get those words down. So here's another G word for you. Gluconeogenesis, I'll see if I can write this here. It's making glucose from a non-carbohydrate source. Okay, so if it's not a carbohydrate, it, it can't be glycogen. It has to be something else. So what that means, it could be from lipids. You can make glucose from lipids. You could make glucose from lactic acid. I'll come back to that in a second. You can make um, glucose from protein, amino acids. And right now, this is just a vocabulary word for you, okay? Um, but if we remember fermentation, okay, which is what pyruvate goes through if there's no oxygen, will produce a little bit of ATP and basically lactic acid. And a lot of times I just call it lactate because it's easier. And there's one word for something, I'll use it. Okay, so for example, just to go over what was covered in that YouTube video and the very good application of it is our skeletal muscles can go through anaerobic respiration quite regularly. Um, if you push your skeletal muscles by working them out really hard and you feel that burn in your muscles, you're feeling 
lactic acid buildup. Okay. Now, I believe I mentioned this in lecture, in real, real person lecture, as well as the YouTube video. When that lactic acid gets into the bloodstream, it can make your blood become acidic, right? Acidosis. And we did cover that in person in lecture. And so the body is going to have to metabolize that lactic acid to get it out of the bloodstream so your blood pH can be corrected. All right. So thinking about what you can do with lactic acid. The body can metabolize lactic acid and turn it into glucose. And that process by you take a non-carbohydrate substance like lactic acid, convert it into glucose that the body can use. That's an example of gluconeogenesis. All right. Okay. So that's just a vocabulary word. So let's move on with this lactic acid metabolism. Okay. I had a little video there. Okay. So your skeletal muscles produce lactic acid all the time, every day, depending on how heavy your exercise is. So you have to be able to get that lactic acid out of the bloodstream. So let me get my little laser pointer here. Okay. So lactic acid from skeletal muscle activity through anaerobic respiration can cause what's known as metabolic acidosis. If it has the word acid in it, you know what it's going to do to the blood pH. Okay. The liver recycles lactic acid using the Cori cycle. See how many times I've said cycle to tie those together. So the liver takes that lactic acid, metabolizes it, recycles it into glucose as gluconeogenesis, right? The liver can also, which we know the liver can do this, take extra glucose and turn it into glycogen and hold on to it in case the body needs it, all right? So by the liver recycling the lactic acid, you reverse any acidosis that happened. You produce a byproduct that the body can use, a couple byproducts, all right? And so, oh, and look here, we're gonna go over those enzymes. I really wanted to be able to go over those enzymes with you today because that's a bit of chemistry and I knew that might've been hard for you. All right, so here we have our skeletal muscles they're being used by exercise, all right? And so the skeletal muscle uses up its glucose stores, causes skeletal muscle contraction. But what happens is when you push them hard and they're running low on oxygen, they will respire anaerobically and they'll produce lactic acid, which ends up in the bloodstream right here. And that is where you can have acidosis. I'll have to get my laser pointer gone, all right? Acidosis. And that's bad. So the liver's going to have to fix that. So here's what the liver does. Now, you're not going to have to memorize these diagrams, but it allows me to go over how the body metabolizes lactic acid. And I get to review the enzymes that I hope you learn by watching the YouTube video. So here we have the liver has taken in lactic acid. And look, it converted it into pyruvate. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So we know that, let me write it down, glucose goes through glycolysis to produce 2-pyruvate, okay? We know that that's glycolysis. And then pyruvate can go through anaerobic respiration or aerobic respiration. But you learned it as the equation going in one direction from glucose to pyruvate. I want you to understand in biochemistry of the body that if the pathway can go in one direction, it can go in reverse as well. And so what's happening is, is the liver can convert the lactic acid to pyruvate. And then pyruvate can go backwards up through glycolysis to make glucose. Ah, okay. That happens. The pathways go bi-directional, okay? So now the liver has an intermediate glucose, glucose 6-phosphate. Great, all right? The liver can use that for whatever energy demands it has. And it can also turn that glucose 6-phosphate into a storage form of glucose called glycogen. Now, the enzyme that allows glycogen to be made is glycogen synthase. A's here means enzyme. The word synth is for synthesis. 
And the word synthesis means to make. And what is it making? The word in front. So it's literally ASE, the enzyme that synthesizes glycogen. Okay. Now, if the liver needed to break down its glycogen stores into glucose, it would begin with this enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase. Again, ASE means enzyme. You might not have learned this in chemistry, but if you phosphorylate something, you break it apart. What's being broken apart? The glycogen. Okay, so that would break down glycogen into the intermediate glucose, but glucose 6-phosphate can't go into the bloodstream chemically, it can't do it. So the liver has a special enzyme, which is glucose 6-phosphatase, that breaks down glucose 6-phosphate into free glucose that can be spilled into the blood, all right? So does that help hopefully explain those enzymes that were covered in the YouTube video. Okay, now I could ask another question. Um, what, what pancreatic hormone would have to be in the bloodstream to make the liver break down its glycogen stores into free glucose and release it into the blood to increase blood glucose? So what is the pancreatic hormone that is secreted when blood glucose is too low? Anyone wanna answer that? Begins with a G. Glucagon. Glucagon, yes, glucagon. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I didn't think I had this question on the slide. Oh, there it is, yes. So that answer, thank you very much, is glucagon, which you think glucose is gone. All right, so we're tying together some things we learned in the first lecture and then the YouTube lecture and then today's lecture. So I took a little time with that, but I wanted to go back over the enzymes. Now, before I leave this slide, because I really want you to have these enzymes down because I know I'm gonna ask them on a lecture exam, glucose 6-phosphatase ends in ASE. That means enzyme. And it's gut the molecule it's gonna be breaking down written in front of it. It's actually got glucose 6-phosphate. It's almost got glucose 6-phosphate in the entire name, except it cleaved off the E. So this last enzyme is the enzyme that breaks down glucose 6-phosphate, right? Another way that you might wanna remember this on a future exam when I say, what's the enzyme that only the liver has that could allow free glu glu uh, glucose into the bloodstream. And you've got glycogen synthase, right? Well, if you understand the enzyme that synthesizes glycogen, you know that's not it. You know it's breaking down glycogen. So then it becomes either glycogen phosphorylase or glucose 6-phosphate or phosphatase, sorry. So here's another way to remember it. Phosphorylase has an L in front of the enzyme, ASE, whereas glucose 6-phosphatase, all right, it has the T in front of the ASE. What comes earlier in the alphabet, L or T? Well, L does. So the glycogen phosphorylase enzyme comes earlier in the process of breaking down glycogen, and then the phosphatase, T comes later in the alphabet, that's the last enzyme that helps produce free glucose. So if you kind of remember these little tricks, it'll help you out, okay? Quick All question. Right. Yes. I see uh, where it says, what is the term? So glucagon is the term. Oh, sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. I will fix that. Let me get my eraser. Good. You know, when you talk and you write and you think at the same time? Thank you. Okay, let me write. Um, the term for making glucose from a non-carbohydrate source is gluconeogenesis, okay? Right. Glucagon is the hormone that causes, ah, I'm gonna use a vocabulary term, glycogenolysis. I like to say it, glycogen o lysis <laughs> because lysis means to break apart then there's an o 
And then what's being broken apart? Glycogen. So this process of taking the glycogen, using these two enzymes to make free glucose, that's glycogenolysis. The hormone from the pancreas that causes it to happen is glucagon. So everyone pay attention to that. I'm very glad you asked that question. I made a mistake in my gray box. When non-carbohydrate molecules are used to make glucose, that's gluconeogenesis. Another thing I think of when I think of gluconeogenesis is, well, I taught you that genesis means to make in the vocabulary terms. And then the word neo, neo means novel or new, okay? And then gluco is short for glucose. So when I take this vocabulary word together, I think genesis, the making, and then I go to the gluco, glucose, and then the neo from a novel source. So gluconeogenesis is making glucose from a novel source. It's not a carbohydrate. So hopefully that will help you remember that. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Okay, can you see that um, it says lipid metabolism? There's no menu or anything in your way, hopefully. Okay, so lipid metabolism. I, I see a big bar in my way. So if you don't. Yeah, oh. there's nothing there. Okay, good. So there's two processes. There's lipogenesis. Now going with what I've taught you about the meaning of these words, what does lipogenesis mean? The making of fats. Making of fats. Making fats. Oops. It, <laughs> my pen is behaving weird here. Hold on. It did this in class before, so I know you've seen it. Making fats. Okay. And then lipolysis or lipolysis, if lysis means to break apart, this is breaking down fats. Okay. So very quickly, when the body has above and beyond the glucose that it needs for making ATP and all of those things, then fat cells in the liver are going to take that extra glucose and they're going to turn it into fat for long-term energy storage. When the body needs energy, let's say you've skipped some meals or you have poorly managed diabetes and your body's not taking in glucose and using it like it should, or someone's so sick, they're simply not eating. When you don't have carbohydrates, your body is going to break down fats in lipolysis, and then those fats will be in your bloodstream and your cells will use them for energy. All right, so those are the scenarios where lipogenesis and lipolysis occurs. So let's go through the pathway by which it happens. Okay, <clears throat> so lipogenesis is conversion of glucose into white fat. White fat is known as triglycerides. That's the white fat that we store um, under our skin, on some organs, things like that, all right? Triglycerides are um, measured on almost every single blood panel, uh, blood chemistry panel that's done. It's one of the things that's monitored. Now, it says here, the adipose in liver. So adipose, just to make sure you're clear, uh, is fat cells. I don't know if you learn adipose as fat cells in anatomy. Okay, so as long as there is the hormone insulin in the bloodstream, all cells will take in that glucose and use it, but adipose and liver cells will also use it. But if they got more than they need, the extra blood glucose enters glycolysis and produces pyruvate. And once you've got pyruvate, you can do almost anything with it chemically. So what the liver does, is it takes the pyruvate, it goes through pyruvate conversion, and then you have acetyl-CoA, all right? And then from acetyl-CoA, now in the YouTube lecture, you learned that acetyl-CoA can enter the Krebs cycle, pump out a bunch of hydrogen ions, which then go through the electron transport chain, make a bunch of ATP. But the liver is doing something else with this acetyl-CoA. It's taking it and it's used to make mainly three products. It's used to make cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is the basis 
for cell membranes, which you learned in intro bio, our phospholipid membrane. All right, so that's one function. And it's also used to make, I'll put for making, steroid hormones. Okay. Things like estrogen, testosterone, those are all made from cholesterol. Um, you probably didn't know that. And there's one other thing I'll put here. And for making the cholesterol, bile. Anyone know what bile is? No? Um, I definitely forgot. Oh, don't worry about it. But you find bile, your liver makes bile, and then it's secreted into the sac that the, that's in the, in the liver behind the lobes called the gallbladder. So I saw a site making bile, comma, found in the gallbladder. That's made from cholesterol. Here's one way to remember it. Um, you've probably heard of gall, gall stones, right? Bladder stones, pretty common. Those stones are made of cholesterol salts. That's why it's called cholelithiasis. Gall stones are called cholelithiasis. Lithiasis means stone and the chole is, they're made of cholesterol salts. So those, those are all very important functions of cholesterol. Now ketones, we talked about that in person lecture. Ketones um, can be used for energy. And we'll have a slide come up here with all kinds of ketone vocabulary. Now, the last thing that acetyl-CoA is used to make is fatty acids. And fatty acids are, I'll say, are turned into white fat, which is known as triglycerides. Okay, so you've now gone from glucose, going through some metabolic pathways here, like, oop, back up, going through glycolysis, then pyruvate, going through conversion to make acetyl-CoA. Then acetyl-CoA, you learn, can be used to make ATP further down the line, but cholesterol is made from it, ketones are made from it, and then fatty acids is one step removed from making the white fat. So this whole process is lipogenesis. Now, the next slide is gonna be lipolysis. I want you to think about it this way. You're simply gonna go from taking stored white fat, triglycerides, and going backwards through metabolic chemical conversion to acetyl-CoA, back to pyruvate, and then maybe making glucose out of it. Now, if I did that, if I took triglycerides, went backwards metabolically into acetyl-CoA, then go backwards through pyruvate conversion to make pyruvate, and then pyruvate went backwards through glycolysis to make glucose. I have made glucose from a non-carbohydrate source, fat. What would be that long G word that would explain that process? Gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis, right? Genesis, the making gluco, glucose, and neo, novel, making glucose from a novel source. Yes. Okay, so next slide. Now we have white fat that maybe the body needs energy and carbohydrates aren't available. Okay, let's talk about the um, ketosis example. All right, I, I told you that I tried that once just trying to lose weight. Um, when you deprive your body of carbohydrates, you're not eating, you're too sick to eat, or you've got poorly managed diabetes. The body's gonna turn to fat stores first to break down that fat and use that for energy. So this is the situation here where lipolysis occurs. So you simply take triglycerides, stored fat, and the body can turn them into ketones going backwards through the slide we just went through, all right? And so the liver can make these ketones from white fat. And then the vocabulary word for the process of making ketones, 
is simply you put the word keto and then Genesis. So we have a lot of redundancy in these vocabulary words. So making ketones from stored fat is ketogenesis. Now, ketones will then be spilled into the bloodstream by the liver. And you can measure this, right? There's ketone uh, dipsticks for urine, okay? And you can also measure them in the blood. But the process of using ketones for energy or having ketones in the blood is ketosis, okay? And uh, I know lots of people that were, were doing this and they were so happy they go to CVS or Walgreens and they get the keto sticks and they say, I'm in ketosis, yay! And then what I've learned is that's not a good thing. That's actually your body's crying for help saying, okay, we're switching to the use of fats, ketones for energy, because we don't have enough carbohydrates. We'll do this, but it's going to come at a cost for the body. The body is stressed. Okay. Has anyone ever heard the term um, ketoacidosis? How about diabetic ketoacidosis. What that is, is you have ketones in the blood because your body's stressed because it can't not get the carbohydrates, the glucose that it needs. So your body goes to fat stores and ketones get spilled into the bloodstream and you're in ketosis. In a hospital situation, if you're the nurse that's looking after a patient that's having poorly managed diabetes and they're in ketosis, that means that patient needs to be managed better because that's a bad thing, okay? All right, so people who are celebrating their in ketosis, not a good thing, not long-term, okay? All right, let's continue on. Now, B, triglycerides can be turned into fatty acids if needed, and those fatty acids can be spilled into the bloodstream, and you can measure fatty acids on a blood panel, all right? Um, and then these fatty acids, can go backwards, become acetyl-CoA, that could jump into the Krebs cycle immediately as it is to make um, ATP with the electron transport chain. So all these are all things that fat can be used for. And so I wanna get in your brain that you're, you learned that glycolysis, then pyruvate conversion, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain goes in one direction. It really doesn't, it goes either way. All right, so you can make something or you can break it down by going in reverse. So if I have acetyl-CoA, um, yeah, it could jump into the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle pumps out a bunch of hydrogen ions that are used in the electron transport chain to make energy, ATP, or the acetyl-CoA can go backwards through conversion to make pyruvate. And then the pyruvate goes backwards through glycolysis to make glucose, gluconeogenesis. Or if it's still in the liver, that glucose can go through glycogenesis to make glycogen if the enzyme glycogen synthase is present, all right? So this is cell metabolism. This is, these equations are going in two different directions all the time. It depends on what the body needs, okay? I hope that makes sense, okay? Any questions before I, I move on from this? What's the difference between a triglyceride and a regular fatty acid? Well, um, chemically, a triglyceride is chemically and structurally different from a fatty acid. Um, it's become, it's like this. So fatty acid is fat. It, 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 ketones are fats. Fatty acids are fats. Triglycerides are fats. What's different between them is their chemical structure. So triglycerides are fats um, that are in a chemical storage form that the body can store. Fatty acids are really fats on the move, all right? Triglycerides are stationary. They're, they're stuck in the liver and in fat tissue. You're not gonna see, you know, sometimes you'll see them in the bloodstream, but really what you see in terms of fat in the bloodstream, it's either fatty acids, which are made to be mobilized in the bloodstream or ketones. They're made to be mobilized in the bloodstream if the body's in an emergency situation. Does that help explain that without getting too chemically on you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have you memorize chemical formulas at all in this course. So I do just try and keep the chemistry to a minimum and, and try and explain why it's relevant. Were there any other questions about lipogenesis, lipolysis? 
Let me check my time here. I'm going to make sure I'm not going long. I'm not. Okay, so let's move on. So as I mentioned in in-person lecture, um, you run a chemistry blood panel on someone. And very common things to see in a chemistry blood panel are, this doesn't show fatty acids, but it shows triglycerides. But fatty acids are included. Ketones are included. And look, cholesterol, all right? I just talked about how the liver can take glucose chemically convert it into pyruvate, then acetyl-CoA, and then acetyl-CoA is used to make cholesterol, all right? Now, since we're in the PD, and if as future nurses you stay in the PD, we know there's the big three. There's high blood pressure, there is diabetes, and then there's general heart disease. So cholesterol in the blood should be within a normal range, as well as triglycerides, fatty acids, and certainly ketones. When they're outside their normal range on a blood panel, especially cholesterol, fatty acids, and triglycerides, those fats, when they're high, are associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular problems. And so me talking about how these substances are made by the body or broken down, um, when you're looking at these things on a blood panel, you know where these things are coming from. Cholesterol is coming from the liver. Triglycerides are basically from the liver or fat cells. Okay. But is it relevant to everyday nursing? Yes, very much so. All right. So that's why I added this little um, snippet of a blood panel in. Okay. So keto vocabulary. Ketogenesis is making ketones. Okay. And then ketosis is using ketones for energy. And what I'll put here in parentheses, ketones in the blood, because they're being used, they're being mobilized because the body, oops, the body has sensed that carbohydrates aren't available. So the body turns to its fat stores, ketones get mobilized into the bloodstream and you can measure that. Now, um, I want you to know that when you're looking at the PowerPoint PDFs while you're online, the links are active, all right? So when you're looking at PowerPoint lectures online and you see a link or it says click here, go ahead and click on it if you're online and it'll bring you to it. So let's look at the clinical app for ketosis here. Okay, I'll make it a little bigger for you. Ketone bodies can be used for energy by many organs and are found in the blood, sometimes under normal conditions. However, if you skip some meal, fasted, or poorly managed diabetes, which means your body's not taking in insulin like it should, um, the increased liberation of fatty acids from adipose and the liver results in increased production of ketone bodies by the liver, all right? Abnormally high amounts of ketone bodies in the blood produces ketosis, which is a sign that someone's missed some meals, meals or they have poorly managed diabetes. So if you have a diabetic patient and they're in ketosis, that's not a good thing. So that, that means nursing, you have to step in and help this patient, all right? Because that's the body saying, emergency, 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 all right? People can go through ketosis for a certain amount of time, but prolonged periods of time, it's gonna cause stress on the body, all right? Um, not shown here, but I'll go back to the PowerPoint, all right? Ketoacidosis is the drop in blood pH from ketosis. And I think I've impressed upon you with the first lecture that a drop in blood pH is a bad thing, all right? You're gonna have problems um, with hemoglobin releasing oxygen at your tissues, all chemical reactions uh, proceed in your body under a narrow range of pH. And if the pH is off with ketoacidosis, those chemical reactions can't happen very well. Um, now, what I wanna do here is explain the difference between ketoacidosis and metabolic acidosis. Basically, there is no difference, all right? Metabolic acidosis is a drop in blood pH
from metabolism. All right. You could be metabolizing and have fatty acids in your blood. You could be metabolizing and using amino acids, protein in your blood. If it has the word acid in the name, it's going to drop your blood pH. Ketoacidosis is just a specific word for metabolic acidosis when you're metabolizing ketones. It's got its own special name, all right? Yes, it is metabolic acidosis, but it's got its own special name. So that's what the difference between those two things are, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, good. All right, so I added this um, because this is something that you're gonna see on a regular basis as nurses. I don't teach it unless I know you're gonna encounter it as nurses. So nutritional versus diabetic ketoacidosis. I don't know if they'll cover this with you in nursing, but um, nutritional, it means several things. It could mean that you're restricting carbohydrates. This is what people who are doing a paleo or keto are doing is they're decreasing the amount of breads, pasta, simple sugars in their diet to force their body to mobilize fat stores and use that for energy. Can you lose fat going through ketosis? Absolutely, all right? It does burn fat. That's what the fat's there for, emergency, okay? But does it come as a cost to the body? Yes, it does, all right? Mobilizing all those fats in your bloodstream can increase your risk for cardiovascular problems. I mean, those fats, um, that cholesterol mobilized in your blood can stick to the inside of your arteries and reduce blood flow, all right? That's um, atherosclerosis, that's heart disease. Um, it can drop your blood pH. If those fatty acids and ketones are in the blood, that's a problem, okay? Um, they also, that's my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully I'm still coming through. Okay, diabetic ketoacidosis, all right? This is for people with poorly managed diabetes. Now, if they're type one diabetic, they're not producing enough insulin. So not this number one right here, all right? Type one diabetic is not producing enough insulin so the cells aren't getting the hormonal permission to take in a glucose and, and use it. Um, people who have type two diabetes, pancreas is producing plenty of insulin. That's not the problem. The problem is the tissues choose to ignore insulin and so they don't take in glucose. So diabetic ketoacidosis can happen with type one diabetes, or type two diabetes, all right? So the body senses loss in carbohydrates, starvation, rapidly the liver and fat cells release fat, ketones, fatty acids into the bloodstream, which the cells when pushed will use for energy, okay? But it can drop the blood, it can cause some other problems, um, increased risk for heart disease with fatty acids and, and cholesterol in the bloodstream, all right? Um, so I just wanted to have that up there because of the nursing application, all right? So if as a future nurse, you've got someone who's otherwise healthy, who admits, you know, they get their blood panel done and their cholesterol is high, their ketones are high, their fatty acids are high. And they're like, what's your lifestyle like? You know, um, oh, they said, well, I've been going through ketosis for the last six months. And then you might want to have that talk with them. Yeah, the body is designed to use ketones for energy when it's desperate, all right? Ketosis is not a long-term nutrition and dietary goal. It comes with risks. The risks, and you as nurses should impart to them, is that you can drop your blood pH. Um, number two, it releases cholesterol, fatty acids, and ketones in the blood, and those fats can increase your risk for cardiovascular problems down the line, okay? So you would wanna have a talk with that patient saying, it's okay if it's done short-term, but this is not a lifestyle choice for long-term. If it's someone who's diabetic, you gotta have to talk with them about how they're managing their diabetes because it's obviously not being managed well, all right? So that's, the, that's getting into lipogenesis, lipolysis, and then the whole keto thing that you'll have to have a talk with your patients about. Okay, so I have a blank flow diagram and a key online, okay? And this is what it looks like. So if we were making fats from extra glucose in fat cells or the liver, as long as there's insulin present, all right, 
the liver and fat cells. I'll put in fat cells. Okay, but I'll just stick with the liver. Take the glucose, convert it to pyruvate. What is the process by which glucose is converted to pyruvate? Anyone? It's a G word. I'll start you out. One glucose enters this. Out comes two molecules of pyruvate, two ATP and two um, NADH2s. Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Okay. This is my way of reviewing with you what you should have looked at on the YouTube video. Okay. Now pyruvate goes through a process to make acetyl-CoA. Anyone know what that process is? I'll start you out. What's the second part here? Pyruvate's being converted to acetyl-CoA, right? Pyruvate conversion. Okay. Now we have acetyl-CoA. Then the liver takes acetyl-CoA. And what's that first thing I said the liver can make acetyl-CoA into? Um, it makes up our cell walls. It helps us make steroid hormones. It also helps yeah, our right. yeah cholesterol. Cholesterol. Okay. And what were we just talking about with a diabetic patient or someone who's choosing to restrict carbohydrates in their diet? What's this other thing that can be made from acetyl-CoA? Ketones. Ketones. And then lastly, the precursor to triglycerides or white fat are fatty acids. So when I have these flow diagrams, it really helps you to write them out because you're thinking. And when you get to the point where you can take a blank flow diagram and fill it out, you've got it down. That's it. And then understand that if you wanted to go backwards and break down fats in lipolysis, you go from triglycerides and then fatty acids, ketones, and cholesterol are released into the bloodstream. And then those can get used for energy. So you see, goes one way, goes another way too. All right, let's look at the time here. Got to wind it up. We're almost done. Okay, the last thing that um, I'm going to discuss that the body metabolizes is proteins. So let me paint you this picture, and this is a drastic one. Let's say someone's starving, all right? They blow through the carbohydrates very quickly. The glucose, gone. Glycogen, all gets broken down into glucose and used. Body goes after fats next, all right? And what happens when you've used up all your fat stores and someone gets really thin and their eyes sink in because the fat stores around the eye are gone? Um, what the body would do next in a starvation situation is go after protein. And the body will use that for energy if it needs to. Okay. That's a very drastic way of looking at amino acid metabolism. Another common way of looking at it is, let's say you consume protein. You consume animal protein or plant protein. And in your body, when that, those proteins, amino acids get floating around your bloodstream, your cells take them in and turn them into human protein, right? That's amino acid metabolism. Now, do not worry about the essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. Um, I'm just going to basically cross that out. I mean, it's, it's interesting to learn, you know, the, the ones that we need to eat are essential. The ones our body makes are non-essential, but you can have more protein than your body can know what to do with. All right. So excess amino acids. All right. Amino acids have the word acid in them. If you have extra amino acids floating in your bloodstream, that's gonna drop your blood pH. That's gonna be metabolic acidosis. And acidosis is not a good thing. So the liver is gonna to come to this, you know, rescue again, da, 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 all right? It's gonna take those extra amino acids. It's gonna convert them into, oh, look, pyruvate. And then from pyruvate, the liver can do all kinds of things with it, all right? Could make fat out of it. Can take that pyruvate, go backwards through glycolysis, make glucose, gluconeogenesis, all right? But the liver is trying to get the extra amino acids out of the bloodstream to reduce acidosis. And so it's trying to do something with what could be a harmful byproduct into a useful byproduct. Okay, so pyruvate could go through conversion, right, to make acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA 
could then jump in the Krebs cycle for ATP, all right? Um, the liver can also convert those amino acids into fat, right? So that process, when you're taking and making fat, that's called anyone making fat, vocabulary word? Lipogenesis. Lipogenesis. Okay. I just went through a whole slide with you about how you take excess glucose. The liver can take excess glucose or fat cells and make fat out of them. All right. This is the liver taking excess amino acids and making fat out of them. All right. And storing it. So all these are chemical processes. All right. The amino acids can also be converted into glucose. All right. Because the liver takes extra amino acids converts it into pyruvate. If pyruvate goes backwards through glycolysis, you've got glucose. And that is gluconeogenesis. Okay. So basic liver we know can recycle lactic acid through the Cori cycle and make glucose out of that. That's gluconeogenesis. It could take extra amino acids, turn it into glucose or other things and stop metabolic acidosis and then produce a helpful product from a possible har harmful product. Now, if the liver has done all it can do with these extra amino acids and the liver's like, I give up, that's it. I can't do anything more. We've got to get you, got to get these amino acids out of the body because it's going to cause metabolic acidosis. So what the liver does is what's gonna end up being waste amino acids are converted into urea and urea is excreted by your kidneys. Checking the time here, all right? Now, blood panels, almost every chemical blood panel will include blood urea nitrogen. Urea is a byproduct of amino acid metabolism and the liver converts it to urea. Urea goes in the bloodstream and then it's excreted by the kidneys in your urine. If someone's blood urea nitrogen, their BUN is high, it's called azotemia, and it could indicate that someone's metabolizing excess amino acids, or they might have kidney failure or kidney malfunction. So here we have amino acid metabolism, and then getting rid of amino acids as urea, and then looking at a common blood panel um, BUN. And when it's high, you're going to be looking at those person, that person's kidney function, or maybe what their body's metabolizing. Okay. So it's around 10, 18. There is another slide, but you know, I can pick this up on Friday. What I want to do is I want to open up two questions that you might have. We've got a couple minutes here that I can answer any questions about this material or YouTube material or anything. Oh, let's see, there's a chat. Okay, yeah. Any questions? Okay, um, go ahead. Well, uh, I'm sorry, will this Zoom be uploaded to the syllabus to rewatch? Oh, yes, yes, yes. When I'm done here, I'm gonna stop the recording and then I'm gonna Put, put this on my YouTube channel. It's gonna take a while. It's gonna take about probably 40 minutes for that to happen. And then I'll make a link to it on the syllabus essay for Wednesday's lecture, click here. Any other questions? Cause it is coming up on 1019. And I know some of you have another class coming up. All right, we'll pick up that last slide on PKU on Friday. I have every intention on being there in person on Friday. We'll be wearing a mask. But thank you to so many of you who participated, came in and asked questions. And um, I hope that went well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the recording. And then later on this afternoon, you'll see a link to the YouTube video for this. All right. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>